Okay, <clears throat> welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody out there. Thanks for joining us today on this webinar. My name is David McQuillan. I'm joined here by Justin DeVore. We'll do our intros here in just a second. But uh, this is the topic today, scope a scanning service engagement. <clears throat> so Justin and I are both on the reality capture teams. We are going to be going over basically some minimal information that we would possibly get from a client in order to scope a reality capture services job. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I've been in reality capture for about 10 years or so. Um, and uh, Justin, why don't you give yourself a, uh, an intro there? Sure. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, so Justin Vohr here, uh, yeah, exclusively on the reality capture team at this moment. My background is in civil engineering and um, and survey, and then just kind of transitioned over to reality capture. Uh, not a replacement for survey or or anything like that. Just just another tool, another you know, just a like another program, another thing that's been added to uh, kind of help improve workflows and. Um, time spent and, and things like that. So, um, yep, as Dave mentioned, part of the reality capture team, uh, we have a dedicated team here that just solely focuses on reality capture, whether that be LIDAR, uh, photogrammetry with drones, and uh, really anything, anything currently out there. So. Yeah, and I would like to add on to that. Um, so today's uh, webinar will be sort of a discussion base between the two of us. Uh, we'll be doing just a lot of back and forth. Um, and so just something I'd want to add to what Justin just said there is we, we perform scanning services jobs all around the country. So wherever you're at watching this um, in the United States, we're happy to come out and, uh, and do a job. And hopefully today you'll get a glimpse on basically what happens in the background. You know, what, what sort of details were you looking at to evaluate the cost of doing those jobs anywhere in the country? Um, so <clears throat> uh, let's move on to the next slide. So we have uh, ATG has our own YouTube channel. And on that YouTube channel, we have things from long webinars, long form webinars like this, which will last you know, 30, 40 minutes. And we have things called tech talks, which are around five minutes. Um, and you know, at ATG, we have a lot of different departments. So you'll find our reality capture videos that we put on here, but there'll also be um, you know, videos from other teams. Um, Justin, do you want to talk briefly about some of the other videos and teams we have here at our company? Sure. Yeah. So here at HEG, uh, we are primarily an Autodesk reseller. Uh, that's kind of our, where we go there. And so we support our customers in in that space uh, on there. And then it's just kind of expanding there. So we've, uh, we fully support the entirety of the AEC Um portion of the Autodesk products. Uh, we don't really get into uh, much manufacturing or uh, any of the entertainment side of the Autodesk thing. So it's strictly on the architectural engineering and construction side of things. So we have a um, variety of, of customers throughout the country, uh, whether they be architecture firms, MEP firms, engineering, uh, one-man shop drafters, you know, um, hundreds of employee type um, type companies uh basically we're here to kind of uh help and consult and uh, uh fit in al along the way um to be able to assist those customers with with their needs uh throughout the aec industry right Good. all right so like i said we're on the youtube channel so go ahead and subscribe to get the latest content there we also post a lot of things to our LinkedIn channel. And I also wanna mention our website. We post a lot of our written uh, materials as well, like blogs or white papers and things like that. <clears throat> so that's that sort of stuff will be posted in our LinkedIn, but it'll also be located on our website. Here at ATG, we use the BIM box. BIM boxes are either laptops or desktop computers that are specifically made for our industry. So we're we're in reality capture, we're gonna be dealing with a lot of like heavy 
you know, data size point clouds. So, and a lot of visual type software. So what we're talking about is, is a computer that's gonna support you in, you know, large hard drive space, lots of processing power, uh, complicated, you know, detailed graphics. Uh, so Finbox is, is a great tool to help keep you productive uh, because as anybody out there in our industry knows, what you don't want to be doing is waiting for your computer to finish, you know, whatever process it's doing and you're just, you know, wasting time essentially. So the days of uh, press go and come back tomorrow uh, should be gone by now, right? So that's what the bin box helps out with. Um, Justin, do you have anything to add on the bin box? No, not really. I think that pretty much sums it up there. Just uh, really just the key is it's a machine that is built for the AEC industry for um, heavy end Revit users, point cloud users, civil 3D, uh, all, all that. It's it's a computer built around uh, those in our industry, you know, so it's not just a gaming laptop or gaming mach machine that we're just making work. Um, this is specifically engineered and built and designed uh, for um, for our job in mind. Great. And we'd also, so Binbox is our computer hardware partner, and we'd also like to thank our uh, laser scanning partner, Leica Geosystems. We are a reseller. Um, so not only will we go out and do services for you and provide you with deliverables, but we will also sell you the scanning equipment, uh, the software associated with it. And of course, we'll do any sort of training and consulting that you would need along the way as well. That concludes the uh, PowerPoint part. So let's go ahead and get into the meat here. Let me move this side here, go. So Justin, oftentimes when we have, um, when we get information from a customer, you know, we, we request certain things, right? We request mm -hmm. photos of the job site, we request um, <clears throat> floor plans uh, in either PDF or DWG format. Um, you know, we request an address for sure, at least, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I would say, was there anything else that you would say that we request right off the bat that we would like to, to get? Uh, no, and, and I may just kind of repeat some items, you know, and repeating like helps things stick too. Uh, but yeah, typically when asked to go out and initially scope out a job, just try to get as much information as possible you, um, to find out how much time is going to be needed on site, for example. So we, you know, the, the details of the interior or exterior space, um, as well as what equipment, you know, we're thinking about uh, you bringing along with us um, and, and be able to verify some of those things. So yeah, typically we'll request uh, addresses, um, anything we can look up on Google Earth or Google Maps, um, you know, floor plans when applicable. And, and a lot of times when we are um, doing this, it's in different stage stages as well. So this could be a uh, remodel plan. So this this floor plan we're looking at um, might not be exact how it is. It might be you know from several years ago, and there might have been a couple of remodels in here. So um, that could be that could be the state of it, or or state of uh, mid construction, or um, or even like looking to do demo or tear down. So um, really, really kind of the whole point is. Um, just like anything else, a good plan, having a good plan in place uh, helps you execute um, execute your job uh, more efficiently. So we try to gather as much information ahead of time um, before um, much as much as we can. That way we can uh, detail out how how much time would be needed on site to be able to get the job done. Exactly. What it all comes down to is time, right? So, <clears throat> all right, so in this, I'm gonna present you with a situation. So we're, we're given an address, right? And then we're given a floor plan. And honestly, not always do we even get floor plans. Sometimes all we do is we get an address. And so what are your first like initial thoughts? Maybe let's, let's take a look at our office building here, right? So 
we would type in the address. What's the first thing that you would sort of initiate, you know, looking at this right now? You know, maybe the, the amount of floors that we would be doing, um, the entrances and exits, you know, what sort of what sort of things, what are your immediate thoughts when you just like, okay, well, let's start evaluating this building and how much work it would take. It, exactly. And that and that usually comes on with with basically kind of a kickoff or a scoping call uh, with the customer. And really it's just depending what are you looking to get out of this, you know, and, and once, once we can understand what you're looking to get, whether that's just current as built conditions or, you know, something a little more of like, a, maybe it's more structurally uh, entwined, or maybe it's even like a piping or, or electrical work kind of thing like that. So that kind of helps us determine uh, what we need to go in and capture, whether that's going to be plenum space, things like that. But but yeah, initially entering it in this address, it would be like, okay, are we doing the entire building? Are we doing specific floors? And and from there, it'd be like, yeah, we're just interested in um, you know the second floor here, uh, and and maybe some of the exterior footprint or um, things like that. And it could also be, you know, uh, is it and then ask if it's interior and exterior, you know, is there going to be any kind of uh, roof plan needed or sides of the building or even drainage of parking lot and, you know, things like that. So um, really just kind of figure out what the intended use is and then just kind of go from there. Yeah, I would like to mention that, you know, as far as a reality capture services, not only we do the interior LIDAR scanning, uh, we'll do the exterior LIDAR scanning, and then to get you know, a broader range or a site map sort of scenario as well, uh, we'll often fly the drone to either you know, get better coverage for the roof or the whole area. And then especially if we wanna be doing some sort of drainage analysis too. And <clears throat> you had mentioned earlier about the electrical and plumbing and things like that. Um, let me just ask you a question that seems to come up. Do does lidar scanning go through walls? No, no, it's all everything line of sight um, when it comes to lidar. So any kind of ground penetration to get um, get stuff in the roadway, uh, whether that be pipe, sewer, uh, electrical conduit, or anything like that. Uh, same same can be said for uh, interior space as well. So uh, with the with the LiDAR technology specifically, that's all just line of sight. So um, in order to grab some of that MEP or electrical or plumbing or, or anything like that, we might have to remove ceiling tiles, which would uh, take more time on site or, or things like that. And um, there is technology out there that can penetrate through ground and, and through walls, but if that's basically what's needed, again, that's kind of the whole point of figuring out what the intended use is. So if it's important to have to see through walls and see what's behind walls, then, then we'll need to know that ahead of time. So we can either get the equipment on site or recommend you know, how, to, how, how best to get that accomplished. That's right. So, or even just explaining the limitations that we have there, and then you know anything with limitations can be worked around, you know, as well. So, uh, for the example of a wall, they, you know, <clears throat> maybe the inside might be important, but if we scan both sides of a room, you know, to get that wall thickness from outside of drywall to outside of drywall, that may be enough to basically kind of fill in the gaps, you know, whether that be wood stud or, or metal stud inside and, you know, things like that. So exactly. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. You know, the modelers, for example, the architectural modelers or the MEP modelers will be aware of what is inside the walls based on the thicknesses, you know, and of course it's not Correct. a perfect science, but yeah, I mean, they can, they can make some pretty educated um, assumptions that way as well. Yep. So, yeah, I would say I would, if I was to add to that there, you know, we have done things where, you know, we'll, we will scan an area that has the MEP in the walls, but they have not yet put up the drywall too. So as an idea for anybody out there who's has a new construction or a remodel and you want to be able to record essentially where everything is <clears throat> in case you need to go in behind that wall in the future, 
Um, this is a great tool for that. But again, well, we would need that either drywall removed or before it was put up. And then um, as Justin said before too, sometimes what we'll do is remove uh, <clears throat> those soft ceiling tiles to, uh, to track like piping and the conduit and things like that as well. I wanna mention here, as we're looking at the street view, sometimes what we'll do is we'll make an assumption off of the ceiling heights and you know, how many floors, sometimes I mean, it's pretty clear here, you know, um, how many floors there are and, you know, but sometimes when we're looking at a building um, that we don't have a floor plan or any really anything besides an address, uh, what we'll do is we'll basically count the number of floors and then oftentimes if this was like a, a smaller office building, there would be basically like one window per office or something like that. So um, do you want to expand on that at all, Justin? I mean, basically like sort, sort of using what we have, right? And then making an educated guess or not. Yeah, <clears throat> well, uh, yeah, not not expand too much on that, but basically, uh, again, the the whole thing is to not go into it blind. You know, that's not going to help anybody. Right. So, when when you have a few minutes to look over this building and then say I was the the customer and then you were getting on the floor with me, that'd be an immediate question. Be like, okay, I, you know, I don't have a floor plan yet here, uh, but what I'm seeing here is this an 11 story building. You know, and and a lot of times they they would either know or they can find out, you know, at a, ahead of time. Yeah. Um, you know, whether there's basement things like that included here, underground parking or or something like that. Um, but yeah, nothing else to really add on that. Gotcha. And I'd like to add that a lot of our customers they don't have floor plans, and that's why they need us to go in there and, and create this data for them. Or like he said in the beginning, you know, they have an original floor plan, but that was in, you know, 1967 and they've gone through four different iterations of remodel and now like the space could be totally different. So mm -hmm. um, for our customers out there that are looking to get a scanning job quoted, you know, it's, it's nice, it would be nice to have, it really helps us, but uh, we, you know, we definitely understand if you don't have one. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about some other like preparation you know, discussions that we might have. I mean, we've, we've been in some pretty, some pretty funky areas before. Um, so let's talk about PPE, mm -hmm. you know, personal protective equipment. We've all, um, you know, we've done anything from, you know, beard guards to steel toe boots to, you know, safety glasses, you know, mm -hmm. it, really bad smelling things <laughs> you know we've we've definitely been in some pretty odd spaces um so i don't know if you have a funny story or just something where pe came into was important or something like that yeah no i it it's it's definitely should be on uh if you're looking to make a checklist of items to ask before going out and scan uh ppe should definitely be on there as well um because there's going to be a lot of sites where, um, you know, it, it may be heavy equipment, you know, so even steel toe might be needed, you know, um, and hard hats and, and things like that. And just just really be safe. Um, I know uh, I was just looking at the attendees and, and checking out for questions here, but I see Ethan Sullivan's on here. He's one of our customers now, but I remember him and I were out uh, doing a abandoned hospital that uh, charity hospital project out in New Orleans. And we had done that together and that condition was, there was no power. It's been abandoned since Katrina, since 2008, 2009. And uh, went and did an interior scan of that. So it's it's been an abandoned building. So there was just, uh, you know, a lot of <clears throat> just kind of dealing with the elements there and finding out the best way to kind of protect ourselves and, and things like that along the way. So, um, but yeah, like right. I said, ju just the uh, PP is just as important as maybe even finding out the address, you know, because if you show up on site and you don't have your steel toes, you know, it's a. Yeah, you could be kicked off that site real quick too, if you don't have the right gear with you. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, we work in a lot of you know, maybe dilapidated conditions because there's a lot of, um, you know, architecture companies or construction companies or engineering companies where they want to, you know, their goal is to repurpose the building, right? So it could yep. be something that has been just been sitting there for a pretty long time 
or, you know, just has sort of run itself into the ground a little bit. Um, so yeah, I would say it's pretty common that we're in a building that is, you know, it's not its most ideal condition. Um, on the other side of that too, sometimes we're in buildings that are so new, they don't even have the, you know, the air conditioning units hooked up yet either. So it's just, you know, so we're, I guess what I'm saying is we're, we're kind of used to all sorts of different circumstances. Um, but yeah, always important to be prepared um, with the PPE there. And then, you know, we've also ran into, into situations where, like you said, where we, there's no power, right? So then we'll start, we'll bring lanterns. We'll start scanning with, uh, with electric lanterns in place as well. Um, so that's always pretty interesting. Let's see here. Um, <clears throat> Perhaps let's uh, let's take a look. Let's let's start analyzing this this uh, floor plan here. And, you know okay. how we would sort of approach this. So I mean, right off the bat, what I'm seeing is lots of doorways, uh, lots of hallways, uh, lots of tight areas. Do you want to expand on you know how that would impact us? You know, quoting this job. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So the um. Again, wh whether we have a floor plan or not, again, again, in this scenario, it's it's really helpful to have it. Um, but you can really, when it comes down to how how are we best going to capture all this area? So if this was wide open, you know, this we'd be talking about different setups and and really a different amount of time. Um, so in this particular thing, as as I noticed this pop up is like you mentioned, a lot of offices, a lot of a lot of doorways and things like that. So uh, immediately my first thought goes to doorway scans because we're gonna have to have one in every doorway to maintain that overlap, to make sure that our registration is going to be accurate, um, that that we can be able to put, tie this in and, and get an accurate model uh, created out of that. So immediately I would, I would just start counting up all the door scans because we would want to be right there in the 50-50 mark uh, to try to be 50% in one room and 50% in the next one. Um, okay. So I want to throw that out there too. I mean, that's, that's the sort of quality that you can expect from our team as well. You know, we don't shortcut and there's a lot of companies out there that do and you know the possibility of you not getting your data sets, uh, it could be quite high at that point because you're going to have situations where the data just won't connect to the existing rooms because somebody tried to shave off a couple minutes here and there with their scans. But um, you know we like to follow some pretty strict rules here in our company, and um, you know hold our team up to to a high standard with that. So although it will take more time to do every doorway the, um, I guess really the, um, we're just gonna be a lot more sure and positive that um, that we'll have a, a complete and good quality data set. Yeah, and, um, and one thing I kind of like to add on that is as far as, you know, like when it comes to the thought of, you know, where can we sh shave some time? Really, what when we are considering doing a uh, lidar scan of this building, we are saving. We are shaving and saving so much time uh, by getting this complete. You know, we're saving multiple site visits and things like that. So, um, kind of one of the first things we'll talk about when we go out on site and train uh, some of our customers that have bought their first scanner um, is we'll talk about. Yeah, it's you know it may be a minute and a half or maybe two minutes or three minutes for an additional scan here in this area. You know, um, you know, that's an extra two minutes that could be very helpful on the back end. That could even save a whole trip out on site. And sometimes these sites, you know, like you have certain windows uh, to be able to get things to be able to keep the project on task. So minimizing site visits um, and trips back out there, uh, again, utilize the technology for that and the fact that it... The fact that we're down to about two minutes per scan location, it definitely, you know, justifies the the means of, of grabbing an additional scan um, when there's a question versus like trying to shortcut. Right. And I would like to mention there too, I mean, that is the power of our Leica scanners as well. I mean, we're, we're 
you know, two minutes, less than two minutes with the RTC, around three minutes with the BLK 360. You know, we're doing field registration as we go. So we're kind of QA, QCing at, in real time. Um, so really powerful, efficient scanners that we're using. And that's what helps us, you know, take on larger jobs. I think ATG is pretty special in that way as well, that we can, we can take on some, some really big projects. And that hospital you were talking about earlier, that you guys did with Ethan, you know, that was a million square feet. I, I challenge, you know, any other reality capture company out there to mention, you know, how many other projects they've done that were around that million square feet marker. So, um, yeah, we've done some pretty impressive things. Um, I think what I was going to do is just sort of show how, you know, how we would plan through yeah. like a scan count scenario. Does that sound good to you? Yeah, that, that'll work for me. Um, looks like you've already kind of started on this a little bit too. Right. Yeah. So maybe we could just talk about that briefly. Mm -hmm. So really what we're, you know, when we're talking about doorways, we're talking about additional scans. And as you can see in this drawing, there's a lot of doorways. Um, so, I mean, let me just take an example here. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's, all right. So here we are with a hallway. Let's start at the end of the hallway here. So this scan here would be would count as a hallway scan. And then we would do an additional doorway scan. And then we do an additional hallway scan. And this hallway scan would sort of be like a nice twofer because it can be both the hallway scan and will be a good connection for both these doorway scans here as well. So what I was saying earlier about like the the rules that we follow and you know us being like um, always making sure we're scanning in the doorway. What you'll see sometimes is people will sort of try to shave off that two minutes or whatever, and they'll put one here, and then the next scan they'll they'll do in the middle here, expecting that this link, this sort of the visual, the visualization between these two scans right here and right here would be enough. And you know, and sometimes it is enough, but um, never is it always enough though. So that's sort of the the double edged sword there. Um, so yeah, basically, you know, it's all about, like, like uh, Justin said, it's all about the, um, the, uh, the line of sights. I don't know, Justin, you want to narrate this a little bit as I sort it, of add these scans here? Yeah. So as David's kind of clicking through, uh, so basically at this point, you know, let's just say we've tasked David with figuring out a scan count for, for this building. So as he's kind of going through, he's going through and getting those 50, 50 scans. So he could even just jump into each, each of those doorways and scan in there. Uh, but he's also grabbing ones in the hallways to make sure that we have good tie in out in front there. Um, you know, because like, and, and also taking into consideration what scanner uh, he's bringing out with him. So is that going to be a BLK 360 or RTC or even like a P40? Uh, and really the biggest difference between most scanners is going to be the, the point cloud density and as well as the range of the, of the device. So if we just take a look at two, two specifically, the BLK360, that will do up to 360,000 points per second on its highest scan setting. Uh, whereas the RTC360 will do up to 2 million points per second. So we have a lot more information. Um, you know, so question there is, will we need high settings? Will, do we have a lot of, um, you know, again, finding out what is needed for this job is that sub millimeter accuracy uh, critical here or if we are within you know yeah. half an inch or even or even tighter than that you know is that going to work too um and then also the other factor on the difference scanners is the range of the devices so uh what we're going to be getting a return so that blk 360 will have a 90 meter range was which is about 150 feet and just like uh, if you imagine a sprinkler system out in your yard for example um even though that sprinkler system says it's 150 feet well that's that's across the whole diameter of that. And if you were setting up a sprinkler system, they call it like good head to head coverage. So you want to make sure that there's enough overlap or the water is hitting 
uh, where you've installed that other sprinkler system. Uh, so we're not going to go 150 feet between scans. We're going to cut that in half um, just to just to be within that range. And you can see David here. We, we you know, with this being an interior space, we don't have the luxury or, or that 150 feet isn't going to be playing a factor into here, uh, with the exception of maybe uh, some of these hallway scans he's doing. Um, but again, a lot of this is uh, as he's kind of counting and, and clicking on some of these, so I'll, I'll kind of point out this hallway he's, he's got there in the middle of the screen. Um, so you see he's got one there right in that intersection of the, of the T there. So he's able to see uh, really all four, all four areas and be able to branch off and be able to, and when you're kind of thinking about this, you want to see how you can register and tie in your scans after the fact. So that that point right there, he's gonna be able to tie in scans to the east or to the plan north, plan south, east or west, uh, just based on that one location. So that that's good location there. And then he, you notice he's also adding scans in front of doorways too. Um, again, if uh, some of this might be a little, little more than needed, but again, if, if the registration isn't gonna be good, again, that extra two minutes that he has of, of, those, of that scan in front of all three of those doors uh, might be what differentiates the project of being able to get this together and get it together accurately. So uh, doing some factors into there. And you can see he's adding one, maybe even two scans per room uh, on the inside. Um, that's just to make sure that basically grabbing as much as you can again this is all a line of sight uh, based um, based equipment so um, even just one scan in the room helps get the other corners corners of the walls and things like that so i'm gonna hop in there so you know we with an interesting study and and an often uh misconception while people while um, customers ask us to quote is they assume it's, it's based off of square footage. But let's take an example of just this little area here where we have several small, I don't know, maybe closets, supply closets or offices, maybe some cubicles here or something. I'm not entirely sure if these walls go all the way up to the ceiling, but <clears throat> this is something with very small square footage, right? But lots of scans, right? Because it's all about that line of sight. So something to think about is discrete spaces and then now here we are coming into a large, you know, uh, open area, right? So here we are in the doorway in this situation, you know, just one right here. Cause like you said, the range and density on these scanners is, is really good. Um, just sometimes we're not able to take advantage of that range and density because of the line of sight. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I would, I would just, yeah throw one there in the middle and then probably just the doorway ones after that because right. if it and as David's adding those doorway ones if even just those two if we kind of look at what area that's covering so the one to the left in that big area that's seeing two openings and it's seeing everything to the right as well and then even that one scan David has you know kind of off by itself there in the middle that's able to see a lot of information. So a lot is going to be able to tie in and in and out of, of that area. So I've got a couple questions for you, David, here. Uh, so one, how do hallways affect scan distance? And then also, do you need them inside, um, in, need them in hallways outside of the doorways as well? So how would how would hallways affect uh, scan distance? So I, I would this is when I do trainings, what I tell people is that hallways and stairs are going to be your most difficult things to work with. Uh, well, hallways is in like long corridors. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just the fact is, is that they're very similar. Right. So one section of a hallway or a corridor will look very similar to the rest. So you have that. Um, and that seems to just confuse the registration software. And so I would say my suggestion there would be stay on top of it. First of all, don't just use the auto align, you know, be, be very aware of what you're doing. If you can't get it to work, uh, throw an extra scan in. Cause you know mm -hmm. what, you're going to spend two minutes with an extra scan. 
And then you're going to spend probably, if you don't do that, you'll probably spend six minutes standing there on your tablet trying to figure out how to get these things connected. So, you know, sometimes you just, you just over scan a little bit in your corridors, right? Um, yeah, yeah, no, the, yeah I, I was just going to say that you bring up an excellent point. So if we're talking about um, scanning and, and using the field. So if you move your cursor to the right a little bit, there's that corridor heading north and south. So there's there's one additional scan in front of those three sets of doorways there. Right. Yeah, that one right there. So let's just focus on that one. Go and highlight that one for me, like draw around it. And there we go. Okay, so this scan in particular. Now, is this one going to be necessary or not? Maybe we have enough overlap between all those doorways and, and things like that. So um, out in the field, David may take that into consideration as he's planning out his next scan. So again, each of these scanners, you got about a minute and a half to almost three minutes between scan location. Uh, so you should always be actively thinking about your next step. You know, if you don't have a plan like this ahead of time, you know, you're always thinking about your next scan location. So David may be thinking, I definitely have to go grab those doorway scans. So I'm going to grab all three of those doorway scans and I'm going to grab those two at the end, um, basically the, the scan to the north and scan to the south. And then he may try to register all those together. And if we get good overlap, he may dis determine at that point, we don't need that center scan. But instead of fighting, like he's mentioning, fighting it on the iPad there out in the field, if he's not able to get those together, he can just run to that red point and grab a scan right there. And then he knows that he's gonna be able to tie all those in together. So um, there is there is ways of shaving it out of there, but that's not something you should determine uh, before you're out on site. Like again, that's that's the whole benefit of being able to do field registration with a lot of this, a lot of this equipment is to be able to verify in QC while you're on site, uh, determine that, you know, and, and again, if we don't need that there, then David's just helping the project, you know, so like he's initially counting, he's accounting for it ahead of time. So that way, you know, when a customer asks, like, how long is that going to be, you need to be on site, he may just say like, uh, we need 20 hours on site. So he is going to count that scam when he's figuring this out, but maybe in the field, we might trim that off, you know, but the last thing you would want to do is anticipate something that's going to be 20 hours, but then have to be out there for 40, you know, so it'd be better to say like, yeah, we'll need 20 and then be done in 18, you know, versus being on, on the heavier end of it. So um, if it may look like doing a little bit of overcount, um, it does kind of seem that way, but uh, through all the jobs that we've scanned, um, we end up end up being either right at or or if not a little more, you know, kind of like I, I feel like what David's representing here is is very accurate to something we may recreate on the field uh, versus trying to cut corners and things like that. Let's let's shift gears a little bit here. So, mm -hmm. how would you say you know? If this space was occupied by people, it's a busy office space. How would that change what we do? Or how, how would we adjust to that? Or, you know, maybe sometimes we use um, like uh, escorts while we're there, um, people to help us open doors, talk to people. Uh, sometimes we work through the, you know, overnight. I don't want to be taking words out of your mouth, but just some sure. ideas, you know, what, how, what do you think about that? Sure. Yeah, no, that, that is, that is something else to add to the list is, is basically what, what's the current use, you know, is this, is this currently abandoned and, and, and open, or is this currently in use? And then if so, uh, we might want to consider different factors of, of um, when would be the best time to go scan. So a lot of times, you know, like, uh, these scanners, it's just a level one laser. So there's, there's no damage being done there, but there's also pictures being taken as well, you know, and there's a lot of people that are not comfortable with their picture being taken, you know, so um, as long as they're know what's going on ahead of time, uh, 
you know, and know that you're coming down the hallway, they can be like, okay, I'm going to go take my lunch now or, or something like that. So uh, again, it's, it's just making sure that everything's planned out ahead of time and that everybody knows what you're doing because the last thing you want to do is start heading down that hallway and somebody pop out of their office of like, what are you doing? Who are you with? You know, now they're cutting into your, your scan time and things like that. So um, it's important to, to get some of that information in place. And if this is really that busy, you know, I don't, you know, these scanners are expensive. You don't want somebody accidentally bumping into them as well. So we may factor in and be like, you know what, we'll just do nighttime scanning with this. So they shut down their office at five, you know, so maybe we'll be there at 4.30, uh, go through with somebody, make sure all the doors are unlocked or, or whatever the case may be, and then go through and, and scan throughout the evening. Um, so that, that could be some of the factors there. Exactly. Yeah. I would say it's, it's very important. So when we're like, let's say an architecture company, they're working for the property management company. So the communication between the architecture company to the property management company, and then from the property management company to the people that are the tenants essentially in this, uh, I think is very important because like you said, I mean, even if it's not important in the way of like sensitive materials or pictures and things like that, even just the polite, you know, Hey, these guys are going to be out there doing this, um, you know, something to just give them a heads up because sometimes that can really go a long way. You know, oftentimes we're in these buildings for a pretty decent amount of time and uh, it just helps everybody to just be a little more, um, you know, aware and, uh, and just polite in that way as well. It, it, yep. So. And, and sometimes like I'll even depending on uh, the facility and who we're able to talk with ahead of time, uh, different departments, um, you know, a lot of times that may be the first thing we do is when we show up on site and maybe meet with the different department heads, you know, in a quick meeting, you know, for 10, 15 minutes, kind of explaining what we're going to be doing, um, doing as well. And, and that goes a long way. So that 10 minutes there in the beginning of the day uh, helps um, helps avoid a lot of uh, headache and, and or stoppages of, of your scanner at that time. Right. Let's, uh, let's talk about scanning outside for a second. You know, a place mm -hmm. where <clears throat> something like the RTC 360 can really shine in its density and, uh, and range and things like that. I mean, you know, let's say this was a 200 foot, you know, wall face on the exterior. <clears throat> you know, how would you, I mean, I, I know how I would do it, but you know, if I was doing one here, right? Let's say in the middle here, right? And then here's an area where we can be really efficient, right? Because we got both faces of this. And uh, so we can place it in the middle here. And so that way we're getting both sides of this. And it's going to be a great tie-in point right here. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So so when we're going around this, I mean, we have we have a good amount of density and range. Um, Justin, why don't you talk briefly about tie-in points, you know, things like uh, access to the outside or stairwells and things like that. Sure. Yeah, so basically, like if we go, let's go ahead and zoom out here a little bit. Um, okay, so as and, and just kind of keep it broad as you're going around the outside and, and kind of go from there. So, uh, as David's kind of working his way around, when I'm focusing on the exterior, now how are we going to be able to tie all these exterior scans to the inside? You know, we want to make sure that we keep that accuracy both inside and out. So now I'm looking at any of the doors outside and David's coming up one here. So he's going to make sure, even though he might be tempted to skip ahead and move to that corner with the range of that scan, uh, we might be one in front of that door to help uh, do those tie-ins. So go and throw in a tie-in scan there at that entry door. Uh, yeah, maybe not that close that that middle one there can be erased, but I just meant the one to the left was you had set that up in front of the door uh, basically anticipating that uh, that there, whereas he probably could have went went ahead to the corner there uh, to be able to do that. And so we got one doorway over there. Uh, you know, we want more than one tie-in point to be able to be on the inside and out. So as we kind of go around the building, uh, looks like there's one there in the corner, then also to the 
plant south is looks like a big entry uh, corridor area and then also um, on the plant east as well. So being able to have multiple tie-in points helps improve and keep maintain that accuracy. Because uh, as we're going around that building, uh, maybe one of those corners did not get the registration just just right, you know. So, uh, are we going to be carrying that error throughout, or uh, can we basically anticipate that and or have solutions for that if we do have an error around there? And and part of that would be having additional tie-in points around, so um, to be able to grab that. And then uh, just basically like how close to the building um would you be All right if you notice i put some a little bit of distance here and you know in my head that was around 20 30 feet away from the wall um you know you with the with the range of those scanners you can get a little bit further away and then that way you can get maybe you know you'll you might get uh, some more distance up on top but i i guess that's kind of just like a generic rule of thumb for me is I'll, I, I try to be about 20, 30 feet away. I yeah. don't know um, if you feel differently, Justin, but. Yeah, well, I'll go, I'm gonna go and switch screens here and kind of show something I have up on here. So we'll go ahead and do this. So we see one kind of tied in here, um, but if we take a look at some of those, those tie-in factors, we got these exterior scans going around. Again, we have one going in this doorway over here and then also tying into this building here and tying in over here too. Um, so here's some of those tie-in points that we're talking about. It looks like we might have a little bit of link error. So we can just go ahead. And the fact that I'm able to delete this link, uh, we're not losing or we're not upsetting, upsetting everything around here because we have enough tie-in points. Again, we have one over here and then also another over here. So. I could link these together or just leave them as is uh, because basically this this section of, of scans is going to be ultimately tied to this entryway. This section of scans is going to be tied to this entryway and, and so forth. So um, being able to factor some of those in. And kind of a big thing to think about is you got to think about it being uh big picture uh you know this this isn't just a top-down scanner it's a full three 360 degree scanner as well so when you're outside you know there's not gonna you're not gonna get any returns up in the sky or anything like that so you're gonna have lower overlap that you need to take into consideration out there as well so think in a 3D space, that's another thing I always kind of bring up when it comes to training on the on these devices, when you're looking to do your overlaps inside and out. Um, think about think about it in a 3D space of how far you can be. So some of these may seem closer than the range is, but when we factor in uh, this scan, you know, where's our tie-in points? You know, we only have so much of this building and so much of this building to be able to tie in. You know, we have a full sky and some ground, you know, so when it comes to this next scan over here, I couldn't just jump from here to there without having another doorway to tie into, you know, so we have a couple um, additional ones there. So um, that's, that's a factor to kind of bring in as well. Great. Well, Justin, with just a, a minute or two left here, how would you uh, strategize your exterior scans when you're going you're planning on combining it with drone data? Okay, yeah. So I would uh, with with the drone da data. Uh, actually, I got this one. We'll go and pull this one up here. Let's get this out of the way. Okay, we'll go and let that point cloud show up here. Okay, so when we're when we're taking about uh, drone data here, um, again, it, when when it comes to combining point clouds, uh, you need basically a frame of reference or tie-in points, right? Uh, so when it comes to adding uh, drone data to that, I'm going to be looking for 
any big um, notifications I could tie into. Okay, so like immediately I'm kind of looking at some of this parking lot striping. So as long as I can see that both in this uh, point cloud scan and then out here in this parking lot too, we're going to take a look over here. We got some of those some of the striping on here to be able to tie in uh, some of those points as well as the side of the wall and then change of asphalt to concrete. Um, those could be some transitions and as well as you know, maybe even we add a third step in here and bring in out a total station and get survey involved, you know, we may have a CSV file from survey of you know maybe. Uh, some of this drainage or maybe in some of the striping corners uh, to be able to integrate and and add those add those in together. Anything else you want to kind of add to that, David? Just, you know, whether it's drone or LIDAR or whatever, it's all about how much overlap and where you're going to be able to tie in everything. You know, even though it's using different technology, like this was flown with photogrammetry um, and then also combining with LIDAR, um, that can be done as long as we have enough frame of reference and enough tie-in points to be able to um, tie that all together. Yeah, I think that's good. I would, yeah, I was just gonna say overlap is key, mm -hmm. right? That's the most important part with combining these two data sets in uh, in recap. But uh, other than that, I think I think uh, we did a good explanation there, and I think we're ready to shut it down. Unless you have anything else you'd like to add. No, I think that's it. Also had another one in here. Uh, you earlier you had mentioned, you know, just kind of the state state of some buildings. So uh, right. we'll kind of look at this one. And you mentioned, you know, like lighting. You know, this obviously has been abandoned and has some water damage in here. Uh, but even just, you know, pictures worth a thousand words. So um, going out here, you know, we're immediately seeing a lot of the benefits of having this uh, laser scanned, right? Um, so we see there's a lot of debris. We see that the floor has a lot of water damage and warping. Um, we can also see one of the lanterns out here to help brighten up the area uh, so that the pictures come through a little more. But just being able to see this, you know, um, it's going to save everybody else um, site visits. So the fact that we go out there once and scan all this information, now this can be used uh, on the back end by hundreds of people that don't have to be like, well, hey, uh, I'm working, I'm working on uh, the structural integrity of this. Can I get the, you know, I, I need to go out and do a site visit on, go inspect some of these beams and see how much water damage has been done. But looking at those images, you know, be able to do that. And then there might be a demo crew in here be like, okay, I can do my estimates on, you know, how many, uh, how many dumpsters I need to order for the site, you know, to be able to clear out this area, you know, so just a, a, a lot of factors that we can do just by sharing uh, this one image or, or even this whole point cloud, you know, there's a lot of uses for everybody out there. Yeah, and I like how, you know, this will be the, as I like to call it, the single source of truth. I mean, you could have five different people from the same company go out and measure the same thing at five different times. And I'll come back with different results. Here you have the same thing going across the whole entire company. Everybody has the same information. So we have a single source of, source of truth to work off of. I think that'll be beneficial. Cool. Yeah, I, th I think that's it. We can open it up to any uh, questions, but yeah, we'll go and uh, um, start wrapping this up. So there, there's a chat window as well as a Q&A board. Uh, if, if anybody has any additional thoughts, questions, uh, things like that, or if you think of one afterward, you know, feel free to reach out to David or myself or anybody at, at ATG in general and just say like, hey, I you know, had some follow-up questions from, from the webinar today. Um, be more than happy to kind of jump on and you know cover some items that that we didn't cover today but yeah this was just kind of a kind of how we would go about maybe initially figuring out how to uh, how to plan out and how to determine how much time would be needed to be on site right i'm gonna add one more thing mm -hmm. if you're a company out there 
and you don't use laser scanning currently and you just want to know how much it would cost you know you're looking at a you have a project coming up and you know it's going to be a large one and you know it's going to be one that's going to be a decent drive away one that you don't want you know you don't want to go back several times in a row to do measurements by hand um just have us quote it there's no you know you don't have to um you don't have to use us you know to be totally honest if you want to just sort of figure out how much it would cost and then yeah maybe that's a really good uh, benchmark for you to know what it would cost for another project in the future that's you know that's okay with us um, so I would say just send us your projects uh, we're happy to quote them get you an idea how much it would cost and then you know just think of us in the future when something you know a good project uh, comes up so cool that's all I got all right sounds good well we're right at the top of the hour so um... I think we'll go and close that out. I don't see any additional questions out there, but like Dave mentioned, just we like talking about this stuff. So uh, feel free to reach out and we'll continue the discussion.